Well, hello, beloved mighty warriors. How are you today? I hope you're having a fantastically invigorating time diving into the wonderful treasure chest of the word. Hey, let's jump in to just a little study together, shall we? Because you know what? There's this incredible treasure chest that's waiting to be explored and endeavored into. And the more we look into it, the more that we are going to find. I'm so glad that we get to go on a journey together. So let's jump in, shall we? Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians. Let's do this thing. It's another edition of the War of the Ages, which means we're going to be studying out the fruits of two different kingdoms, right? We're going to talk about what those seeds look like, because today we're going to talk a lot about seeds. We're going to talk about the ravens that come to steal. We're going to talk about the strategies and the tactics for how the Father preserves His Word and how we're able to see the fruitfulness of man laid bare before all people. You ready for this? Colossians 1. Shaul, and I'm reading from the ISR Scriptures translation. I know a lot of you guys ask me, but it's always in the descriptions below. There's links, all kinds of links. My audiobook, my ebook, the audio entirety recording of the Scriptures is down there below. There's prayer resources. Like, all of that's there as gift to you guys. Understand, that's what it's for. If you guys want to find these Scriptures that I'm reading from, that's where it is, all below. I'll also put little tidbits of other links to stuff that we talk about as we go along at times as well. So, jump in there if you're looking for something. Anyways, chapter one, Shaul, an emissary of Yeshua Messiah by the desire of Elohim and Timotheos, our brother, to the set apart ones in Colossae, it's Colossians, right? That's the book. And true brothers in Messiah, favor to you and peace from Elohim, our father and the master Yeshua Messiah. We give thanks to the Elohim and father of our master Yeshua Messiah, praying always for you having heard of your belief in Messiah Yeshua and of all your love for all the set-apart ones, because of the expectation that is laid up for you in the heavens, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the good news, which has come to you, as also in all the world it is bearing fruit and growing, as also among you, since the day you heard and knew the favor of Elohim in truth. See, this is the beauty of how the word is supposed to be utilized, how it's supposed to be treasured up. We are supposed to take this word and all through the scriptures, there's these incredible parables towards seed, towards fruit and germination. If those of you who are listening though today have never taken a seed, a simple seed like this right here, let me show you something. Now this is the root, but it's close enough. You guys can get the idea. This is tarot. I'm gonna be dropping out an episode from my class that I took on growing tropical perennials as annuals. Taro is one of the, like these amazing crops that we can grow ourselves here in the States in the, in the more temperate climates. You can grow like a root vegetable, like sweet potato or something like that. And it'll produce these magnificent, beautiful ornamental leaves that are edible. You got to boil it and cook it first, but incredible leaves. And then these big like tubers similar to a potato. But this thing, when we sow this thing out into the earth, it's going to germinate. It's going to sprout up. And it's going to start a new plant, right? This is what the word was designed to be done. And for those of us that are carriers of the words, the one that have it, we're supposed to be going out and sowing the seeds, sowing those seeds. We're coming into a season of springtime where people are planting their seeds and preparing to do that. Understand, as we go out and do that, we are doing that in faith, not knowing 100% certainly whether or not the seed is going to actually germinate. First and foremost, we don't know if that seed's going to sprout to life or not. Also, we don't know if it's going to soon be destroyed by frost, by horrible conditions known as pests and disease and pressures. But what we do is we do that in confidence and faith in believing that there's going to come a time where we're going to reap the rewards of the labor that goes into that process. This is so much of the story that we find in the scriptures when they compare it to the word of truth. Now, this is always contrasted. It's juxtaposed to the word of falsehood, the words of lies, right? We have an enemy who is actively going out and doing a counterfeit version of this. We have a, an enemy filled with farmers who are continually, diligently sowing the words of deceit, disinformation, falsehood, lies, subtility, and craftiness, right? Their kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, their goal is to keep men blinded, whereas Yeshua, his goal in his kingdom and his word is to open the eyes of the blind so that they can see. But you know what? As we look diligently in the word, we're going to find really important parallels to how we can protect the word, how we can go forth and make sure that the word is able to be utilized most effectively. 
let's carry on. Verse 7. As you also learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, who is a true servant of Messiah on your behalf, who also created, declared to us your love in the Spirit. That is why we, from the day we heard, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his desire in all wisdom and spiritual understanding to walk worthily of the Master, pleasing all, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Elohim, being empowered with all power, according to the might of his esteem, for all endurance and patience with joy. You see, the, the power of prayer is being emphasized so strategically. And there's some of you guys just blow my mind with your fervency to pray, to intercede towards your other brothers and sisters, to care for them, who, and especially for those that are lost or hurting or wounded and weary. The power of prayer is like, I, when I find verses like this, this is the stuff that you should take in your scriptures and highlight it. And better yet, if you have just a journal that as you're reading along, you can draw, j- jot these down because whenever you find in the scriptures someone describing their prayers, that's a huge, awesome, like zero in on a, on a moment in time to take that and set it down in ways for you to pray. It's not necessarily that you have to pray word for word what they said, but as you study that, you will begin to see the principles that are being used in there. And, and what, he's, what he's praying for the people to be filled with is the knowledge of his desire. So people need to know the desires of our creator and to have all wisdom and spiritual understanding and that we would walk worthily of the master, pleasing all and bearing fruits in good works, increasing in the knowledge of Elohim. These are like the goals that they were praying and interceding for people that were in an arena in a place, in a locality that was taken over by the kingdom of darkness. These people were not operating in free societies. And I think as we in our country here in the States and in places where we have taken for granted the liberal nature of our society, and I mean that in like the true ancient sense, the ability to speak freely, to have thought that is diverse and broad and a a society where thought police are not a reality, but he, but today we're living in an in a society that's criti- becoming more and more critical of individuals who would express themselves boldly, and let alone biblically. Those that as, that are holding to biblical morality are becoming the persecuted few, are becoming the persecuted ones by and far. And because of that, it's made us. And if you guys even think about it, in the last 20, 30 years, how different you talk today versus how you talk 20 or 30 years ago and how much there's this degradation to the language and an attack on directness of communication for the sake of trying to to cater towards people's emotions to buffer the word like i've i've watched progressively in the churches that i was a part of throughout my life i watched in many of them this watering down of the gospel the selective pruning away from where there was offensive statements but it's clear, like the Messiah specifically says to us, don't be easily offended. Don't be easily offended because the truths that he came to bring are offensive to people, especially those that are caught up in the snares of it. It's not easy to, to bear those things up. But as you increase in your knowledge of Elohim, as you increase in your knowledge and understanding of the wisdom of our creator, this disparity between the ways of truth and the ways of falsehood increase exponentially. And you know what? But we are now in a society that's trying to shove us back into the box so we don't talk about it anymore so don't talk like that and that fundamentally they're trying to quell our boldness they're trying to extinguish the boldness all the while they themselves personally become more and more emboldened to their truth because the seeds of evil are germinating and with them come boldness for their beliefs but it's something that is really interesting like even at this conference that i went to people that were on a very different paradigm a very anti messiah paradigm to the equation, anti-biblical morality, were so bold about their convictions and were upfront with it right away. And you know, it was such a stark contrast to be in the room when somebody else stood up and introduced themselves with boldness and transparency about their beliefs that was juxtaposed to those that were in the room. It was a beautiful contrast. And you know what, as these days of amalgamation are growing where people are assimilating b- beliefs and ideologies from all kinds of the doctrines of demons. They're going to be 
most noticeably offended at those that have this staunch, strong convictions. But you know what? That's the fruit of our labors and learning how we can take the knowledge that we have, take the skills that we have and use it to try to impart understanding to others because a lot of them have never heard the authentic gospel. A lot of them have never heard the, the kingdom story. They've never heard the, the full story about the kingdom. There is this preaching of the gospel that many people receive when they're young or at different times in their life. And it's a very watered down version that doesn't go into any kingdom context. And so because of that, they have no footing to stand up when the kingdom of darkness comes to try to take back its own. As we carry on here in verse 13, it says, or verse 12, it says, giving thanks to the father who has made us fit to share in the inheritance of the set apart ones in the light who has delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the reign of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, who is the likeness of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation, because in him were created all that are in the heavens and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulerships or principalities or authorities, all have been created through him and for him. And he is before all. And in him all hold together. He is the head of the body of the assembly, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might become the one who is first in all. Because in him all the completeness was pleased to dwell, and through him, to completely restore to favor all unto himself, whether on earth or in the heavens, having made peace through the blood of his stake. And you, who were once estranged and enemies in the mind by wicked works, but now he has completely restored to favor in the body of his flesh through death to present you set apart and blameless and unreprovable before him. If indeed you continue in the belief founded and steadfast and are not moved away from the expectation of the good news, which you have heard, which was proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I shall will became a servant who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and will fill up in my flesh what was lacking in Messiah's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the assembly. You see the beauty of this? He is explaining that the authority of the kingdom of darkness and understand those that reject the word of truth, those that do not come to the kingdom of righteousness, they are under, by default, they are under that direct authority of the kingdom of darkness. And because of that, they are subjected to have a mind of wicked works so that their minds are infected with the doctrines, the influences of the kingdom of darkness, and they cannot break free of that. You know, like you see a very a clear example of this in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13. Come on over. You want to talk about Absalom, Amnon, and Tamar? David. It's a brutal chapter. Not a fun one to read. But what you're seeing in this chapter is, is two major agents, one of which who gets persuaded by a counselor who's consumed with wisdom of the evil one. He is one who is willing to do whatever it takes to advance their agenda and their ideology. And he is literally, later on when they talk about when David actually has his running for his life, when his kingdom is taken over by Absalom and his insurrection, the counselors that come to these people and, and counsel to try to destroy David and root him out. Listen, these people are, are, their minds are poisoned by these wicked thoughts and they're germinated when they finally have an opportunity to counsel somebody in a direction of total destruction. Chapter 13. And after this, it came to be that Absalom, son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was distressed, even to become sick because of his sister Tamar, for she was a maiden. And it was hard in the eyes of Amnon to do whatever to her. And Amnon had a friend whose name was Yonadab, the son of Shema, David's brother. Now Yonadab was a very wise man. And he said to him, Why are you, the sovereign son, becoming thinner day after day? Explain it to me. And Amnon said to him, 
I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Yonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be sick. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and make the food before my eyes so that I see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. And when the sovereign came to see him, Amnon said to the sovereign, Please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me before my eyes so that I eat from her hand. And David sent to Tamar to the house, saying, Please go to the house of your brother Amnon and make food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house while he was lying down. And she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes before his eyes and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and turned them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Make everyone go away from me. And they all went out from him. And Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom that I eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon her brother in the bedroom. And she brought them to him to eat, and he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him and said, No, my brother, do not humble me, for it is not done so in Yisrael. Do not do this wickedness. And I, where could I take my shame? And you, you would be like one of the fools in Yisrael. Now please speak to the sovereign, for he would not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her voice. And being stronger than she, he humbled her and lay with her. Amnon then hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, go. And she said to him, No, for this is evil of sending me away is worse than all the other you've done to me. But he would not listen to her. And he called his young man serving him and said, Now put this one out away from me and bolt the door behind her. And she had on a long coat. For the sovereign's maiden's daughters wore such garments. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her long coat that was on her and put her hand on her head and went crying away bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? But now keep silent, my sister. He is your brother, so do not take this to heart. So Tamar re remained in the house of her brother Absalom, but was ruined. And Sovereign David heard all these reports, and he was very wroth. Now understand something here. David does not take action to defend or to, to bring justice in this situation at all. And if you read it just from these texts, you're going to be like, why not? It's really frustrating because you see it, David abdicate his responsibility to do justice as the king, first and foremost, let alone as the father. And yet he does not do that. Now, what you find is in the older manuscripts, there's a verse that explains why that actually gives you the direct explanation of why this is from that Dead Sea Scrolls Bible. And right here in the book of Samuel, you'll see the why. This is same thing in chapter 13. Um, so in continuity of verse 21, it said, when King David heard about all these things, he was furious, but he would not inflict pain on his son Amnon's spirit because he loved him since he was his firstborn. It says here is the note, followed by the Septuagint, this one preserves the note about David's failure to punish Amnon and the reason for it. The Masoretic text seems to have lost it when the scribe's eyes skipped from the negative that begins the skipped line to the negative that begins verse 22. See, David had this deep love for Amnon because he was his firstborn son, and he didn't want to cause him pain or inflict pain upon him. But what happens is these seeds of lust, first and foremost, we had a seed germinate in the heart of Amnon early on. This lust that, that grew and festered in his heart took over him, right? It ruled him bodily. It took over his very physical well-being to where he couldn't eat. Like he was, we call this lovesick, right? There's a real physiological effect that the heart can have on us. The heart contains neurons, literally similar to your brain. It, store, it can store memory. It can encode it. This is why after a relationship comes to an end, there's this, this literal pain, physical pain that we feel. Like our bodies can experience in the form of, of grief and agony. 
Well, this thing can happen as well when that lust germinates. And this is when a temptation grows and starts to give fruit to it, right? Like in the book of James, it describes it best about how the process of, of the enemy or the opportunities for sin to come into our life, how they germinate and the full sequence of what those look like as those things mature. Turn with me to the book of James, Jacob. Just for what it's worth, you guys, the book, the book's name was not James. They, they literally, the writers, the King James were like, Hey, let's say, let's call it James. He'll like that. The King will like that. He, he the guy who paid for it, right? The, the book is called Jacob, Jacob. Literally, that's the name of the book. Every time you've ever read the book of James, they lied about the title of it. It's Yaakov, like right here. See that? That's the actual name. Go figure. Makes a little more sense. This is like half-brother of Yeshua, which is why all of you who are believing the false doctrine of demons that Mary was a perpetual virgin have ascribed yourselves to the cult of Diana. I'm sorry, you're worshiping a different mighty one, and you're standing and receiving your commands and your instructions from the literal mouths mouth of the beast. Just saying. Virginity of Mary was not per into perpetuity. She had other children. We're going to read one of their books right now. Very important to understand that stuff. It just says plainly in the Gospels that Yeshua had other brothers and sisters. It's important to understand. They didn't come from a different person. All right, you ready for this? We'll jump down into uh, verse 13 in chapter 1. Let no one say when he is enticed... I am enticed by Elohim, for Elohim is not enticed by evil matters, and he entices no one, but each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and trapped. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. Do not go astray, my beloved brothers." Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of turning. Having purposed it, he brought us forth by the word of truth for us to be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, that, so then, my beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of Elohim. Therefore, put away all filthiness and overflow of evil and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your lives and become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and immediately forgets what he was like. But he that looked into the perfect Torah, that of freedom, and continues in it, not becoming a hearer that forgets, but a doer of work, this one shall be blessed in his doing of the Torah. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is worthless, clean, an undefiled religion before Elohim and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We see an absolute perfect manifestation of that take place in this story. He is being enticed early on, Amnon is. And you know what? That enticing is now giving, he's now giving thought to it because somebody has come along into his life that's like, I'll help you with that problem that you're having. And he gives him counsel but his counsel that he gives to him, uh, what was his name? Yonadab. Yonadab gives him counsel and he gives him wisdom, but wisdom to do evil. Right now he is, that seed is germinating. It's like it's deepening its roots and it's starting to find some fertile ground in this guy's heart because he wants to give his, give into it. Right. But once the act is, the act is actually completed, you see the fruit of it. It totally leads to death. Listen, he ruins his sister-in-law. He ruins his sister ruins her and it's going to lead to his own death it's also going to lead to even further consequences that you're going to see here take place this literally sets the stage for the entire insurrection the treasonous insurrection of absalom to the kingdom of israel when he takes his place of his father and seeks to murder his father to assassinate his father and have him killed and to take over the entire kingdom of israel this is literally all from this mighty little seed 
germinating in the heart of Amnon. And understand something. This is how principality wars are truly fought. This is how kingdoms are overthrown from one tiny little seed. Understand something. The effective power of what a seed can do, it, the roots of a, of a little tiny seed can split concrete. We think about compaction issues in our soils and everything's like that. Like a, a great example of this is dandelion. Dandelion and comfrey also incredible. These deep penetrating roots. You can have if you have dandelion somewhere. Dandelion is the fruit and the evidence of overcompacted soils. When you see dandelion somewhere, it's because that root is very very good at penetrating hard soils that other plants cannot grow in. Once the compaction issues are dealt with in a soil and it's much more aerated and it's much more, um, it's, uh, it's looser, other seeds are going to be able to germinate in there and the dandelion will disappear. There's been like a globalist agenda to eradicate dandelion. It's like the marketing agency of every Monsanto and Roundup commercial you've ever seen in your life has dandelion dying. It's like, they're like, crucify it, crucify it. Now you're like, it's dandelion. One of the most nutritious things you can possibly eat. Not even joking. Same with comfrey. Save the world. Thank you, Billy, for teaching me the wonders of comfrey. Comfrey is even better. It'll put six foot deep down roots and everything needs it in their life. Don't listen to the propaganda that's anti-comfrey. They're liars, thieves, scoundrels. The devil doesn't want you to know about the goodness of comfrey and dandelion. Save the world. Plant comfrey and dandelions. Be that guy. Be that guy. Go blow those dandelion puffs everywhere you can. Change the entire face of humanity, one dandelion at a time. Let's go back to David. Verse 22, And Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good nor evil, for Absalom hated Amnon, because he'd humbled his sister Tamar. We're about to see a man take his wrath out, by the way. The wrath of man is about to be executed. It's not good. And it came to be after two years... Two years that hatred's been brewing. Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Chatzor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the sons of the sovereign. And Absalom came to the sovereign and said, See, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the sovereign and his servants go with your servant. But the sovereign said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go now, lest we be too heavy on you. And he urged him, but he would not go. And he blessed him. And Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the sovereign said to him, Why should he go with you? And Absalom urged him. So he let Amnon and all the sons of the sovereign go with him. And Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Watch, and when the, the heart of Amnon is glad with wine, and I shall say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and brave. And the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the sons of the sovereign rose up, and each one mounted his mule and fled. And it came to be while they were on the way that the news came to David, saying, Absalom has stricken all the sons of the sovereign, and not one of them is left. And the sovereign rose up and tore his garments and lay on the ground, and all his servants stood by with their garments torn. And Yonadab, son of Shema, this is the same guy who counseled Amnon two years ago, is still at David's side. He answered and said, Do not let my master say that they have killed all the young men, the sons of the sovereign, for only Amnon is dead. For by the mouth of Absalom this has been appointed from the day that he humbled his sister Tamar. And now let not my master the sovereign take the matter of this to heart, to think that all the sons of the sovereign are dead, for only Amnon is dead. And Absalom fled. And the young man who was watching lifted up. Hold on a second. Do you guys see this though? Do you see how you have a counselor of the king who literally facilitated the literal raping of David's daughter by his son? He's still at David's side. Do you think David really knows that it was Yonadab that did that? Do you see how insidiously infectious people that are Loose-lipped, uh, lying-lipped, these forked tongues of the serpents. I mean, what an, a horrible evil. This guy's still at David's side. And you know what? This guy is going to be a, a critical part of the story all the way to the end. Has a different thing inside his heart. He's the whitewashed tomb to be warned about. And Absalom fled, and the young man who was watching lifted up his eyes and looked and saw many key people who were coming from the way behind him on the side of the hill. 
Then Yonadab said to the sovereign, Look, the sons of the sovereign are coming, as your servant said, so it is. And it came to be, as he had finished speaking, that, Look, the sons of the sovereign came, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And the sovereign, too, and all his servants wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, the sovereign of Geshur. And David mourned for his son all the days. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there for three years. So David then longed to go to Absalom, for he had been comforted concerning Amnon because he was dead. So now we have the fruit of that sin borne out in the life of Amnon. Amnon is dead. Absalom is in hiding because he did the thing that his father refused to do, which was to deal out justice against Amnon. And instead, he took it into his own hands. And now what is he suffering? Now he's in isolation and he's in holding. But in that land, in that other place, the seed of this evil principality is still germinating. It's still festering and growing. And you know what? It's it's spreading out its roots. Like underground, underneath our feet, there's this soil food web, this living web that, that grows out anywhere. If you take one inch of soil and you were to start to pull apart all of the very fine mycorrhizal like root system, that's where we get funguses and 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 uh, mushrooms and things like that. All of these tiny microscopically small hairs, you can have seven miles of roots in that one inch of soil. And so on the surface, it surely doesn't seem like there's a lot going on here, but inside the heart of Absalom is a growing web of darkness. These wicked thoughts are germinating in him and they're spreading out tendrils and they're looking for more nutrients. They're looking for ways to anchor in deeper and deeper and deeper. And you know what? He is the chosen man to manifest this destiny against David. Because understand, the adversary wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he works very hard behind the scenes to eradicate freedom and peace and life wherever it is growing, wherever it's fostered. And so that's what his strategy has become. He is targeting, and he's looking for an agent of evil to enact these things. If you guys have the book of Jubilees, this is uh, Genesis and the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical text. This is put out by Rob Skiba, um, a mighty warrior for the kingdom who uh, fought his final race a couple of years ago. He, he finished his, his race a few years ago, most regrettably in some ways, I'll tell you that much. But for those of you that were so appreciative and so blessed by his ministry and his labors, pick up the torch and run. That's what you do. When one of them goes down, keep going. Pick up where they left off and keep going. You know, they labored very, very diligently for the kingdom. Him and Russ Dizdar were taken out within about a week of each other. And it was a huge blow a couple of years ago. But you know what? Don't squander it. That guy put out a lot of resources. This being one of my favorite things that he ever put out. I have like, I don't know, I've gotten through like six copies of these things, giving them out and reading through them over the years. It's incredibly valuable. But in the book of Jubilees, like we talked about, and in this scriptures over here, the Dead Sea Scroll Bible, there were more copies of the book of Jubilee than almost any other text that were found uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book of Psalms, the book of Isaiah, the book of Deuteronomy, and the book of Jubilees were some of the most prevalent scrolls that they were finding in there. But the book of Jubilees has some great insight right here into the enemy using an individual to really advance his agenda. Check this out. If you guys have it, we're going to jump over to chapter... 15. Let's see. This is in chapter 11. And in the 35th Jubilee, we'll jump into verse 1. And in the 35th Jubilee, in the third week, in the first year thereof, Reu took to himself a wife, and her name was Ora, the daughter of Ur, the son of Kesed. And she bore him a son and called his name Sero in the seventh year of this week in this Jubilee. And the sons of Noah began to war on each other, to take captive and to slay each other and to shed the blood of men on the earth, to eat blood and to build strong cities and walls and towers and individuals began to exalt themselves above the nation and to found the beginnings of kingdoms and to go to war people against people, nation against nation and city against city and began to do evil and to acquire arms, and to teach their sons war. And they began to capture cities, and to sell male and female slaves, 
And Ur, the son of Kesed, built the city of Arra of the Chaldees and called its name after his own name and the name of his father. This is the origin story for Ur of the Chaldees, where we hear Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees. This is the physical individual who established that city. And this was the foundations in which he established it. Listen to this. And they made for themselves molten images, and they worshipped each the idol, the molten image which they had made for themselves. And they began to make graven images and unclean simulgra, simulgra, and unclean simulacra and malignant spirits like unclean spirits and evil spirits. Malignant spirits assisted and seduced them into committing transgression and uncleanness. So when when people are engaged in making idol in making idols, so so many of us just have this idea in our head that they're just yeah they're just kind of doing this stuff. They sit down and they carve it out. It's evident that the spirits behind the scenes are the ones influencing them and guiding them and directing them. This is literally what they call spirit guides. These are people that are a part of this. Oh man, I had an incredible conversation with somebody that just interviewed. Oh, I, I could do, I, hopefully I can get them on to share their, their entire encounter. They just went down and interviewed one of the people who is very much on the, on the side of declaring out the truths about health and wellness when it comes to oh, Dr. You know what? I got to save that story. Anyways, they went down and talked to somebody who is a doctor who's very high up and very well known and world renowned on being the side who's trying to expose a lot of the dangers, of a lot of these things that are going out there. And yet inside his house and the mer person himself, he was literally communing with his guides, his spirit guides. And they were just sitting there like jaws on the floor, like, what the heck is this? The person was very much led by a very different spirit. And these guides literally influence them and direct them on how to do these things. And so you think it's so often we have this idea that these are like cavemen drawing sticks on walls and carving sticks and making these little idols. But there are very intelligent beings behind the scenes to cause people to do these decisions. One of them is called Mastema, the name that's given to like Satan in the scriptures here in, the, in this passage here. Uh, verse four. And the prince Mastema exerted himself to do all of this, and he sent forth other spirits, those which were put under his hand, to do all manner of wrong and sin and all manner of transgression, to corrupt and destroy and to shed blood upon the earth. For this reason, he called the name of Serro, Serug, for everyone turn to do all manner of sin and transgression. So literally, the en the enemy, Mastema, as we read earlier in chapter 9 in Jubilees in a previous episode, this is like the prince over all the demons. Noah was interceding before Yahuwah and asking him to bind up all these malignant spirits that are tormenting his sons. And he's like, listen, Mastema was like, listen, leave me one-tenth, bind nine-tenths of them, put them down inside the earth, and let me have one so that I can enact my will on the men that are wayward and rebellious. And Yahuwah agrees to this. These, this is the leader of that army, and this is the one who is using them to enact sin, destruction, corruption, and the shedding of blood on the earth. So when you guys look at something like what's taking place on the news, we can, on one side, study the surface level of it. Who are the physical agents who are a part of this? But you must understand there's the spirit guides behind the scenes that are wanting blood to be shed on the earth, that are wanting corruption, that are wanting deception. And this is why those are the wicked thoughts manifesting, bearing forth fruits in the hearts of mankind and why the kingdom message is essential to go out because it's the only actual cure that we have. We cannot sign a global peace treaty. We are not going to be able to inoculate people with some other drug from this, this agent of fear that's being sown into their hearts because it's rooted in a kingdom problem. They are parts of the kingdom of darkness and they need to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And you know what? Abram is like the embodiment of that. He's the one who breaks the generational cycle of idolatry because Abraham's grandfather is raised up in this idolatry. His father is raised up in this idolatry till he's like one of the preeminent idol makers in the community. But Abraham rejects it. He's the one who breaks the generational cycle. And this is something for you guys to study and consider. 
part of the prayers that I'm, I'm a big fan of as well is praying against generational curses and asking the father to bind that we bind any generational or familiar spirits from attaching to or influencing me or my family. And we loose the kingdom of, of Yahuwah to, to within us and around us as we walk in his commandments that he would be bless us, right? Like you never bind anything without loosing something in its place. The enemy, there is, there's no spiritual vacuum in the kingdom. Okay, so understand that. But like when you bind these generational spirits from afflicting you and your family, you loose the set apart spirit into your lives to work in your life in that place. But these things are those carryovers. People would want to look for a genetic marker, a genetic hallmarker of, of alcoholism or of these different diseases. The truth is you're dealing with generational spirits in a huge way way that has to get addressed. You've got to deal with the spiritual roots of disease before you can address the physical manifestations of those diseases as well. But Abraham's the one who breaks the cycle. Uh, we're going to jump into verse nine here in uh, verse eight. And in the 37th Jubilee in the sixth week, in the first year thereof, he took to himself a wife. Her name was Jaska, the daughter of Nesteg of the Chaldees. And she bore him Terah in the seventh year of this week. And the prince Mastema sent ravens and birds to devour the seed which was sown in the land in order to destroy the land and rob the children of men of their labors. Before they could plow in the seed, the ravens picked it up from the surface of the ground. And for this reason, he called his name Terah, because the ravens and the birds reduced them to destitution and devoured their seed. And the years began to be barren, owing to the birds, and they devoured all the fruit of the trees from the trees. It was only with great effort that they could save a little of all the fruit of the earth in their days. And in the 39th Jubilee, in the second week, in the first year, Terah took to himself a wife, and her name was Edna, the daughter of Abram, the daughter of his father's sister. And in the seventh year of this week, she bore him a son, and he called his name Abram, by the name of his father of his mother for he had died before his daughter had conceived a son. So you see the enemy's strategy now is to utilize the animals to come in and enforce this famine on the land. And remember we talked about last, last episode, when you give your daughters to whoredom, the whole land gets filled with wickedness. This is literally the consequences of it. When you got these massive diseases coming in or these massive plagues, here we have ravens coming in to devour the literal seeds off the face of the earth and all the fruit of the fields. But they're being influenced and cultivated and controlled by mastema behind the scenes. Now, that's most of the people that are looking out at weather conditions or they're looking at plagues of locusts or whatever it may be. If you have a plague of locusts, you don't have too many locusts. You just don't have enough birds, right? That's, that is the reality of the situation. Every problem is the solution in so many ways in permaculture. It's like the massive motto of permaculture. The problem is the solution. You know, Yahuwah, when he wanted to deal with all of these different plagues and problems that came in, he had an immediate way of clearing it out because you're dealing with spiritual powers and authorities that are governing the acts on the earth. And this is why if you lose sight of kingdom warfare, you're not going to be able to make an astute observation nor a diagnosis on what to do, nor be able to apply the right remedy to a situation. So you've got to keep kingdom eyes oriented all the time. Abraham gets them right here. Abram gets them right here. Check this out. And the child began to understand the errors of the earth, and that all went astray after graven images and after uncleanness. And his father taught him writing, and he was two weeks of years old. That's a way of saying 14 years. And he separated himself from his father that he might not worship idols with him. What a valuable son. What a brave son. And he began to pray to the creator of all things that he might save him from the errors of the children of men, that his portion should not fall into error after uncleanness and vileness. And the seed time came for the sowing of seed upon the land, and they all went forth together to protect their seeds against the ravens. And Abram went forth with those that went, and the child was a lad of fourteen years. And a cloud of ravens came to devour the seed, and Abram ran to meet them before they settled on the ground, and cried to them before they settled on the ground to devour the seed, and said, Descend not, return to the place where you came. And they proceeded to turn back. And he caused the clouds of ravens to turn back that day seventy times. And of all the ravens throughout all the land where Abram was, there settled there not so much as one. 
And all who were with him throughout all the land saw him cry out, and all the ravens turned back, and his name became great in the land of the Chaldees. Do you notice how Abram called out and cried out against these ravens 70 times? Now, when you go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8, we talk about the division of the nations according to the number of the sons of Elohim. That number is 70. This is literally, this, this is one of those screaming things of like a declarative stance against all of the principalities of the other nations coming to a devour the seed of mankind, to come to devour the seed of life. And yet there's one nation. This literally in the loins of Abraham is the nation of Israel who Yahuwah chooses as his, his inheritance. He chooses Jacob as his inheritance. He allows all the nations of the earth to go under the other principalities. But here is Abraham demonstrating authority and supremacy of his kingdom being exerted over the kingdom of darkness. This is why his name became great because these things were back then much more understood like the the value of reading things like jubilees or jasher or maccabees is it gives you contextual insights into what people of hebraic ideology thought of these were the books they were reading these are the books they were they were examining and we are being raised up with we are so deprived from that mindset that we can't look at the scriptures and have the same contextual lens with which they see it but when we put ourselves back in their mindset Suddenly, these things make so much more sense to us. And so why throughout the scripture, you're going to see these numbers of authority be brought out over and over again. This is Abraham demonstrating direct authority over the principalities of the kingdom of darkness right here. So good. But first, he had to drive idols out of his own life and his family's life. That's what he sought to do. And there came to him this year all those that wished to sow. And he went with them until their time of sowing ceased, and they sowed their land. And that year they brought in enough grain home and eat and were satisfied. And in the first year of the fifth week of Abram, taught those who made implements for oxen, the artificers of wood, the woodworkers, and they made a vessel above the ground, facing the frame of the plow, in order to put the seed thereon. And the seed fell down there upon the share of the plow and was hidden in the earth. And they no longer feared the ravens. And after this manner, they made vessels above the ground on all the frames of the plows. And they sowed and tilled the land according to as Abram commanded them. And they no longer feared the birds. So this is demonstration of wisdom being poured out upon Abraham. On Abram to be able to come up with a device that they could put a seed box on top of the plow that as they're plowing along the field and the furrow is broken open by the plow, a seed is able to fall down into the earth and then be covered up again. This is, um, I'll show you guys, this is one of my favorite tools in farming. For those of you guys that don't know about Johnny Seeds or small scale or even market gardener size farmers, Johnny Seeds is one of these companies that has incredible innovations of tools to be utilized as as ways of, of getting things done more clearly and as soon as i read this passage uh to my girls i was like oh my gosh this is the jang cedar like exactly which is an incredible little tool i'm going to show you guys a video of it because it's fantastic those of you that want to find out about different ways of farming and gardening more efficiently more effectively this is one i'll show you guys this one this is from Johnny, Johnny Seeds right here, Johnny Select Seeds, fantastic company. This is their Jang JP1 push seeder. They have a whole bunch of different seeders. I'll go back here so you guys can see this. This is uh, their websites. They've got all kinds of different tools and things like that. But these are their different seeders, which are, are ways of being able to get seeds into the ground more effectively. There's some you know more simple versions. Then there's a little more technologically advanced ones, ones that you can kind of jab in to, to make individual holes at deeper depths. And then the Earthway Cedar, this is a little more budget one for those of you wanting to do it. But the Jang is the Jang is a beast. This one's just way you can sow out the seeds and distribute it out. And I've used this six row cedar as well. You know, when you're planting more closely knit crops together. Check this out though. I'm gonna show you guys the Jang. This thing's a champion. Look at this guy. This is fun. This is a few minute long video. Just watch it, you guys. Watch it to the end. You'll get an actual visual representation from your thought wisdom, like Abraham applying it here. Hi, my name is Paul Gallion. Today we're at Johnny's Research Farm in Albion, Maine, and we're going to be discussing the Jang JP1 Clean Cedar. And now for a general overview of the Jang 
JP1 clean seater. It consists of a number of different parts. We have the drive wheel in the front, the press wheel in the back. Right in the middle, we've got the heart of the machine, which is the furrow opener. Here we have the plain shoe furrow opener, the seed hopper with the seed metering mechanism, an adjustable handle, not only in the vertical position, but also horizontal, so that way you can step away from your seeds off to the side of the bed. Let's take a closer look at the Jang Seed Hopper. The hopper assembly in total, we've got the funnel, retaining clip, hopper cover, which actually doubles as a seed gauge. Here we have the seed roller and the drive sprocket, along with the metering brush. Let's actually go ahead and sow some carrot seed. We've chosen Bolero, which is a very nice fall storage variety. Based on the information on our variety cross-reference chart located on the internet, it tells us that we want to use our MJ12 roller. We've included the MJ12 roller in the seed hopper, and now we need to determine the spacing. Located conveniently on the chain drive cover, is a spacing chart. We want to space our carrots at two inches. Based on this chart, we want to place our nine tooth sprocket on the rear shaft and the 14 tooth sprocket on the front. Each sprocket comes stamped with a number corresponding to the number of teeth. Now that we have the correct sprocket arrangement, and roller choice, we will now replace the cover and tighten. And next we're going to fill the hopper with seed. Again, we've chosen our fall storage variety. Now we're ready to seed. We've selected the correct roller. We've also selected the correct sprocket arrangement. Now all we need to do is adjust the handle to your appropriate height. And we're also going to offset the push bar so that way we don't have to walk right behind the row we're seating. Here we go. One of the great benefits of the Jang Cedar is not only the singulation of the seed, it's the spacing of the seed in the furrow, and also the firming to create a fine seed soil contact that's necessary for proper seed germination. Come on now. Isn't that just brilliant? For any of you that has ever tried to sit there and sow carrot seed, it's like picking up dust and trying to individually plant that stuff. But that, that little tool enables you to be able to plant exactly right at the right depth, the right spacing, and to have it compacted back down onto the seed so there's good contact so it can germinate properly. That's brilliant wisdom being able to be imparted upon that. That's what Yahuwah literally imparted to Abram. That gave him a solution that the rest of the entire earth didn't yet have. Do you understand how, how powerful it is? that the father gave him the solution when he was the one who rejected the idols of man because people were still caught up in the soil food web that everybody else's heart was bound up in all of the intricate web of evil. They could not see the solution that was actually right there before their faces. But Yahuwah gave that to Abram and literally helped to establish him and his renown across the earth, similar to what you see happens with Joseph. Yahuwah gave him the insight to know how to prepare and to protect and provide for the people of the entire earth because of Pharaoh's two dreams. 
those two dreams were given to Pharaoh, and yet the entire counselors, all of the people that he relied upon for wisdom, did not have the actual wisdom from Yahuwah for how to take that dream. And that's what established Joseph as the one to save the world. And you know what? Never underestimate the power that Yahuwah has waiting for how his sons and daughters can rise up with wisdom to confound the nations and save people from this this kingdom of destruction that's falling that we're they're falling prey to. You know what? I know there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there. I know there's a lot of bad news that you can look on, but you know what? The more you saturate yourself in this, the more interconnected your roots are that are in your heart to this word, the greater wisdom the greater knowledge, the greater insight, the greater understanding you will have to navigate that one out there. A critical component to your preparedness comes from this word, to being an effective person on this earth, to being able to resist the schemes of the wicked. The more you're rooted and grounded in love and that you have this word being sown into your heart on an ongoing basis and the water of this word coming in, the greater you will be able to contend against the adversaries that are out there and abounding. I'm going to pick back up in our, uh, I want to read through actually this story. You guys just come on with me for a little journey. I'm just going to read through the story of what happens with Absalom's rebellion because I want to continue to highlight the just the, the costliness of this sin from Amnon. You're going to literally see this play out for the next couple chapters, but it's a great illustration of seeing how this really takes root. So it picks back up in chapter 14. And Joab, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, this is the king of David's army, or the commander of David's armies, knew that the heart of the sovereign was towards Absalom. And Joab sent to Tekawa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, Please pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments and do not anoint yourself with oil, but act like a woman who has been mourning a long time for the dead. Then you shall go to the sovereign and speak to him according to this word. And Joab put the words in her mouth. And when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the sovereign, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, Save, O sovereign. And the sovereign said to her, What is your trouble? And she answered, Truly, I am a widow. My husband is dead. Your female servant had two sons, and the two fought with each other in the field. And there was no one to part them. But the one struck the other and killed him. And see, the entire clan has risen up against your female servant and said, Give him up who struck his brother, so that we put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed, and destroy the heir also. Thus they would extinguish my burning coal that is left, and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the earth. And the sovereign said to the woman, Go to your house, and let me give commands concerning you. And the woman of Tekawa said to the sovereign, my master, O sovereign, let the crookedness be on me and on my father's house, and the sovereign in his throne be guiltless. And the sovereign said, Whoever speaks to you, bring him to me, and let him no longer touch you. And she said, Please let the sovereign remember Yahweh your Elohim, and the Redeemer of blood, not destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As Yahweh lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. And the woman said, Please let your female servant speak a word to my master the sovereign. And he said, Speak. And the woman said, And why have you reasoned like this against the people of Elohim? For in speaking this word, the sovereign is as the one who is guilty, in that the sovereign does not bring his outcast one home again. For we shall certainly die and become like water spilled on the ground, which is not gathered up again. Yet Elohim does not take away a life, but shall devise ways so that his outcast ones are not cast out from him. And now I have come to speak this word to my master and the sovereign, because the people have made me afraid. And your female servant said, Please let me speak to the sovereign. It could be that the sovereign does what his female servant asks. But the sovereign has listened to the deliver his female servant from the hand of the man seeking to destroy me and my son together from the inheritance of Elohim. Then your female servant said, Please let the word of my master the sovereign be comforting, for my master the sovereign is as the messenger of Elohim in discerning the good and the evil. And Yahuwah your Elohim is with you. And the sovereign answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide from me the matter I'm asking you. And the woman said, Please let my master the sovereign speak. And the sovereign said, 
Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? And the woman answered and said, As your being lives, my master the sovereign, no one turns to the right or to the left from all that my master the sovereign has spoken. For your servant Joab commanded me, and he put all these words in the mouth of your female servant. Your servant Joab had done this to change the appearance of the matter. But my master is wise, according to the wisdom of a messenger of Elohim, to know all that is on the earth. And the sovereign said to Joab, See now, you shall do this matter, and go and bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell to the ground on his face and did obeisance, and blessed the sovereign. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your eyes, my master, O sovereign, in that the sovereign has done the word of his servant. And Joab rose up and went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the sovereign said, Let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. And Absalom went to his own house, and did not see the sovereign's face. And in all Yisrael there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his handsomeness. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for it was at every year's end that he cut it because it was heavy on him, when he cut it weight of his head, the hair of his head was at two hundred shekels by the sovereign's weight. And to Absalom were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. And Absalom dwelt in Jerusalem two years, and he had not seen the sovereign's face. So Absalom here, you're going to find the root of his entire downfall is literally his looks, his vanity here. The people have been praising Absalom about his beauty his entire life, which unfortunately is actually its own curse in its own way, because now he has had that praise of men go to his head. And you know what? It's the root of all kinds of evils is pride. Fundamentally, pride is literally the guaranteed rootstock that the vast majority of the trees of evil have grown from. Something to be most diligent to prune out of your life. And Absalom dwelt in Jerusalem two years, and he had not seen the sovereign's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the sovereign, but he would not come to him. And he sent again the second time, but he would not come. And he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab rose and came to the house of Absalom and said, Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom said to Joab, Look, I sent to you, saying, Come here, so that I send to you to the sovereign to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It was good for me while I was there. And now let me see the sovereign's face. And if there's any crookedness in me, then you shall put me to death. Joab then went to the sovereign and informed him. And he called for Absalom. And he came to the sovereign and bowed himself on the face to the ground before the sovereign. Then the sovereign kissed Absalom. Chapter 15. And it came to be after this that Absalom prepared a chariot and horses for himself and 50 men to run before him. So Absalom now hires market he, he hires psychological marketers. That's it. He hires a PR campaign, a press campaign, who's going to go ahead and start to do the propaganda. We talked about the psychological operations unit from Fort Bragg, the United States Army uses to, to beguile, win, deceive, influence the enemy and their own team. This is literally what Absalom does here. He's like, I, you know, I need to start getting people to be pumped up about me. So let's hire some strong, good-looking campaign managers, and let's prepare. You know what this is? This is literally, what is it called? This is the the PAC. <laughs> this is the political campaign group that's like the super PAC behind him. This is totally what's going down here. You guys get ready for this. He's like, here comes the election year. Doesn't look like that. Watch this. And Absalom used to rise early and to stand beside the way to the gate. And it came to be whenever he, anyone had a complaint to the sovereign for a right ruling. Let me go back. And it came to be whenever anyone who had a complaint came to the sovereign for a right ruling, that Absalom would call to him and say, What city are you from? And when he said, Your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel, Absalom would say to him, Look, your matters are good and right, but you have nobody from the sovereign to hear you. And Absalom would say, Oh, 
that I were made a judge in the land, and every one who has any complaint or case would come to me, and I shall let right be done to him. And it came to be, whenever anyone came near him to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And Absalom did this to all Yisrael, who came to the sovereign for right ruling. And Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Yisrael. This is huge. And it came to be at the end of 40 years that Absalom said to the sovereign, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vows which I vowed. Other manuscripts here say four years, at the end of four years. So now Absalom is literally waging this war against the hearts of Israel, and he is trying to steal them from his fathers. And we're seeing the cunningness and the deceitfulness and subtility and craftiness for weaponizing the thoughts and the intentions. He's, he's buying people's souls, right? He is influencing the people through this propaganda campaign. And he's like, I'm going to slowly make myself a judge and a ruler over the people so I'm respected and revered. And I'm going to go in between my father and the people so that they come to me for their needs to get met. And by doing this over those years of time, he was able to slowly and incrementally steal them away and get their loyalty. But understand something, a loyalty that comes through cunningness and craftiness and subtility will never pass the test of trial by fire. It never does. You'll see that here. And the sovereign said to him, go in peace. Oh, sorry, go back. Let's go back to verse 8. Oh, verse 7. And it came to be at the end of four years that Absalom said to the sovereign, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vows which I vowed to Yahuwah. For your servant vowed a vow while I dwelt at Geshur in Aram, saying, if Yahuwah indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I shall serve Yahuwah. And the sovereign said to him, Go in peace. And he rose up and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the voice of the shofar, then you shall say, Absalom is sovereign in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men from Jerusalem who were invited. And they went along unsuspectingly and did not know the matter at all. Absalom also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, counselor of David from his city, from Gilo, while he slaughtered slaughterings. Now, this is another one of David's counselors who is going to be a conspirator against David. You got some rotten fruit in a bunch of these counselors. You know what I'm saying here? And it came to be, while they slaughtered, and it came to be that the conspiracy became potent for the people with Absalom, kept, for the people with Absalom kept increasing Conspiracy theory time, 101. You ready for this? People who have ulterior agendas are plotting radical, intelligent evil against you every day, literally, and they don't want you to know about it. So their goal is to keep their methods secret as long as they can because they're ambush predators, and they know they got to get their prey unsuspectingly, which is why they're poisoning you at the grocery store every single time you walk down those food aisles. You think you're buying food, you're buying death. And they're like, yeah, it's safe and effective, and we'll kill you and your children, most certainly. It's 100% a surety that you are living in a land filled with Absaloms, plotting conspiracies to destroy people, to steal their hearts, to control their minds. You live in a world run by government-sponsored, mind-controlled people. It's reality, like Project Mockingbird. Go look it up. It will blow your mind. You ready for this? There's nothing new under the sun, you guys. When we study the, 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 the history, when we study history, we find the same types of stuff taking place then, which can give us clues to how to defend ourselves and inoculate ourselves from their deceptive web. Again, verse 14. Uh, let's go back. Verse 13. Then a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Yisrael are with Absalom. And David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Rise up, let us flee, for none of us shall escape from Absalom. Go in haste, lest you overtake us quickly and bring evil upon us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the sovereign servant said to the sovereign, Look, your servant shall do all according to all my master the sovereign chooses. And the sovereign went out and all his household at his feet. But the sovereign left ten women, concubines, to look after the house. So the sovereign went out and all the people at his feet, and they stood still at the last house. And all his servants were passing on at his side, and all the Kerathites and the Pelathites and the Gittites, six hundred men who had followed him from Gath, were passing on before the sovereign. And the sovereign said to Ittai the Gittite, 
Why do you go? You also with us? Turn back and remain with the sovereign, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your own place. You came yesterday, and should I today make you wander up and down with us when I'm going wherever I'm going? Return and take your brothers back. Loving commitment and truth be with you. And Ittai answered the sovereign and said, As Yahuwah lives, and as my master the sovereign lives, in whatever place my master the sovereign is, whether in death or in life, let your servant also be there. Therefore David said to Ittai, Go and pass over. And Ittai the Gittite and all his men and all the little ones who were with him passed over. And all the land was weeping with a loud voice. And all the people were passing over. And the sovereign himself was passing over the Wadi Kidron. And all the people were passing over toward the way of the wilderness. And C. Zadok also came, and the Levites with him, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of Elohim. And they set down the ark, and Ebiathar went up until all the people completed passing over the city. And these are the Zedekite priests, by the way. When you hear this word Zadok and all the rest, this is the institution of the Zedekite priesthood, which is who was those guys over in Qumran at the caves who were preserving these scrolls that we find like in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were not eaten. I know, just a massive propaganda game against these guys. Anyways. The God Culture has an incredible series on dealing with the Qumran caves and the Zedekite priesthood who was there in Qumran and why they were not Essenes, these mystic Gnostic heretics. They were not the Essenes who were there. They were the Zedekite priesthood that had been driven out by all of these other Pharisaical priesthoods that came in and bought their way into the temple. Something to consider, you guys. Dive down that incredible truth trail. Verse 25, And the sovereign said to Zadok, Take the Ark of Elohim back to the city. If I find favor in the eyes of Yahuwah, then he shall bring me back and show me both it and his dwellings. But if he says thus, I have not delighted in you, here I am. Let him do to me as it seems good in his eyes. And the sovereign said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimat, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Ebiathar. See, I'm waiting in the desert plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. And Zadok and Ebiathar took the Ark of Elohim back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. So David is setting up a, what's called like a rat line in the uh, world of espionage. He's setting up a trail of people who can deliver messages, information, supplies. He's, he's creating a network, an underground network, to be able to survive in a persecuted season and time. Because he doesn't know how long this is going to last. Those of you that have read the story, like you know, you know now how long it lasts. But he also doesn't know how long he's going to have the opportunity to get information from the inside. And so he's sending the priest class back to be able to use them as the spy train to get him information. You can learn a lot about setting up intel and resistance fighters. These are the Gibberim, you guys. These are the mighty men of valor. This is literally where they come from and how we can learn from them right here. And David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. And David was informed, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators, conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh, Yahuwah, I pray you make the counsel of Ahithophel foolish. These are things we should pray every single day, you guys. Start praying that the counsel of wickedness would be made foolish before our leaders and rulers and governors, that the counselors that they are surrounded with, that the wiz that their counsel that they're giving to these people would be made foolish, laid bare and naked before the nations. These are weapons in your warfare, you guys, and things that we must critically pray that their wicked thoughts would be laid bare and that they would come to ruin that they would not prosper, but that they would be exposed because they have these ulterior agendas. And you know what? It's what's leading such destruction. Like they're passing laws to make it illegal to crit critique certain products, certain medicines, certain companies that put out medicines. They're making it illegal in different countries for you to even speak out against it or crit criticize it. This is why these Orwellian ideologies, like we are prophesied by the false prophets of Baal, these people have put out books like Brave New World. Like you're literally seeing the controlling of thought police and mind speak or double speak. They're, they're literally instituting laws to prevent you from speaking. 
And that fundamentally, this categorically goes against the freedom that the Father has given to us. And these are things we must defend ferociously. Verse 32, And it came to be that David came to the summit where he bowed himself before Elohim, and saw Hushai the archite coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you pass on with me, then you shall become a burden to me. But if you return to the city, say to Absalom, I am your servant, O sovereign, once servant of your father, but now I am your servant. Then you shall nullify the counsel of Ahithophel for me. And are not Zadok and Ebiathar the priests with you there? And it shall be that every matter that you hear from the sovereign's house, you should report to Zadok and to Ebiathar the priests. See there with them are their two sons, Amimots, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Ebiathar's son. And by them you shall send me every matter. And Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. This is really important. If you've got a spy network that you're trying to set up, you only tell the people that are absolutely necessary in there. Loose lips sink ships. And uh, you need to trust that there could be other spies, double agents and triple agents in your camp. And so you've got to keep it very, very small as to who is the people that are there to communicate that information back to you. But this is David now. He's like, all right. You're going to be my guy to try to resist Achimatz. He's like, you're my resistance force in that area. And then you need to bring me word on what goes down through these rise. Chapter 16. And David had passed on a little from the summit and saw Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys and on them 200 loaves and 100 cakes of raisin and 100 summer fruit and a skin of wine. And the sovereign said to Ziba, why do you do these? And Ziba said, the donkeys are for the sovereign's household to ride on, and the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for the wearied to drink in the wilderness. And the sovereign said, and where is your son of your master? And Ziba said to the sovereign, see, he remains in Jerusalem, for he said, today the house of Israel is going to return to the reign of my father to me. And the sovereign said to Ziba, see, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I have bowed myself. Let me find favor in your eyes, my master, O sovereign. And when sovereign David came to Bahurim, he saw a man from the clan of the house of Shaul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gira, coming from there. He came out cursing as he came, and he pelted with stones David and all the servants of sovereign David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And this is what Shimei said as he cursed, Get out! Get out, O man of blood and man of Belial. Yahuwah has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Shaul, in whose place you've reigned. And Yahuwah has given the reign into the hand of Absalom, your son. And see, you are in your own evil, for you are a man of blood. And Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the sovereign, Why should this dead dog curse my master, the sovereign? Please let me pass over and take off his head. Gotta love the sons of Zura. And the sovereign said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? For you let him curse, even because Yahuwah has said to him, Curse David. And who should say, Why did you do that? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, See how my son, who came from my own body, seeks my life? And how much more now this Benjamite? Leave him alone. Let him curse. For Yahuwah has spoken to him. If so be, Yahuwah does look on my affliction. And Yahuwah shall return good to me for his cursing today. And as David and his men went in the way, Shimei walked alongside him on the way and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and kicked up dust. And the sovereign and all the people who were with him became weary and they refreshed themselves there. And Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with him. And it came to be when Hushai the archite, the friend of David, had come to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Let the sovereign live! Let the sovereign live! And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loving commitment to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, No, I am for the one whom Yahuwah and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, and with him I remain. And besides, whom should I serve? Should it not be before his son? As I have served before your father, so I am before you. And Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your advice. What should we do? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, 
Go into your father's concubines, whom he's left to look after their house. And all Israel shall hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you shall be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. And Absalom went into his father's concubines before the eyes of all Israel. Now the advice Ahithophel gave in those days was as if one had inquired at the word of Elohim. So all the advice of Ahithophel, uh, so all the advice of Ahithophel, both to David and to Absalom. Do we see another counselor counseling sexual impurity again? This is like the inherent heart of this disease. But understand something. Yahuwah prophesied this very act to take place years and years and years ago when David went in and stole the wife of Uriah, committed adultery with her, and then had him murdered, had him killed by the sword of his enemies under the command of Joab. Now, literally, Uriah the, Uriah was the man's name. He was listed as one of David's Gibborim, one of the mighty men of valor of David, one of his like best warriors. He also, in the Dead Sea Scrolls text, it has an amendment to that verse when it describes who was Uriah. It said he was the armor bearer of Joab, of Joab. Literally, like a guy they knew well, Joab's armor bearer is literally put to death at the command of King David by the orders of Joab. Like it's a crazy, brutal conspiracy of sexual immorality and then murder. And then you see the fruit of this now germinating and coming back. The consequences of those actions are now coming on magnified because this is what seed does. It multiplies. You got a tiny little mustard seed. Hold on. I actually have a mustard seed for you guys. Let me show you guys. I finally got mustard seed so I can show you this. There it is, you guys. Oh, no. I dropped it. <laughs> That's why I need the jang. You need the jang, y'all. You need the jang cedar. Ready? Let's see if I can hold it up to you. Bam. <laughs> There's your mighty mustard seed. That's a mustard seed. That's it. You know the parable when Yeshua was talking about mustard seed grows seeds of faith. Tiny little, even if any of you has the faith of a mustard seed, as small as a mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain and command it to be throw itself into the sea. This is what he's talking about. Farmers would have known this. Mustard's delicious and nutritious and incredibly beneficial for your life. That's a mustard seed. This will grow into a tree. Here's a watermelon seed. This will grow into a vine that will, there you go. For size comparison, check that out. This will grow into a vine that will take over a large area of your garden. This will outlive it. This thing will be monumentally bigger and longer lasting. This is what they grind up, you guys, when you're like eating mustard. You're like, yummy, yummy. They grind up mustard seeds, get mustard oil, and that paste from it. That's where you get stone ground mustard. You'll see that in there. You should get try. You guys should try to germinate some of those seeds. See if you can do it. Tell me how it goes. Anyways, at this conference, at Organic Growers Conference, they had a seed swap, which is when we do Linenite meetups, when we do like meet the Linen Railroad, we'll kick that off again here. We're trying to plan that right now behind the scenes to have some epic guest speakers coming in. But it'll be in an area of the country that we weren't last time, you know, because praise yeah, the Reynolds have relocating. They had a seed swap though, and there was just all these different seeds that people had brought in, whether they were growers or seed farmers themselves or people that were just backyard hobbyists to the big guys. They brought in all kinds of seeds and they, you could pick out your own little packets of it. By the way, that variety of mustard is uh, the southern giant, the curled southern giant. They had little seed packets. They had little scoops so that you could get your own seeds because this is the beauty of life. You know, People that grow seeds are generous with it. Collards, hallelujah for collards. There's the watermelon, the crimson sweet watermelon. We're going to try a bunch of these out. Garlic and chives because I'm going to start making a lot more pho Vietnamese dishes and the garlic chives are like everything in that for garnishing. We got other ones like sugar drip sorghum, hallelujah, sweetness that grows out of the earth. I'm learning a lot, you guys. I'm so excited. This is the fun stuff to do. I am not the precision gardener. I'll tell you that much right now. I like the jang and that kind of stuff, but my favorite style of gardening is wild gardening, gorilla gardening. I just like to sow all kinds of wild stuff together and to see what wants to live there and take over. Chelsea is much more meticulous and she's very careful and precise. Anyways, there's your seed war going on all the time. David's tiny little mustard seed of bad decisions are playing out big time later on in life. Chapter 17. Now a whole bunch of thousands and thousands and thousands of people are going to die because of that decision too. It gets worse. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, 
Please let me choose twelve thousand men, and let me arise and pursue David tonight, and come upon him while he's weary and weak. And I shall make him afraid, and all the people who are with him shall flee, and I shall strike the sovereign alone, and will bring back all the people to you when all the people return. When all return except the man whom you seek, all the people should be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. But Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also, and let us hear what he says too. And Hushai said to Absalom, and Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken according to this word. Should we do as he says? If not, speak up. And Hushai said to Absalom, the advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. And Hushai said, You know your father and his men. They are mighty men, Geborim. And they are as bitter in being as a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is a man of battle who would not spend the night with the people. See, by now he's hidden in some pit or in some place, and it shall be when some of them fall at the first, that whoever hears it shall say, There's been a slaughtering among the people who are following Absalom. And even he who is brave, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, would utterly melt. For all Israel knows that your father is a brave, mighty man, and those who are with him are brave men. But I advise, let all Israel without fail be gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand by the sea, and that yourself go to battle. And we shall come upon him in some place where he is found, and shall fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. And there shall be left of him, and of all the men with him, not even one. And if he withdraws into a city, then all Israel shall bring ropes to that city, and we shall pull it into the wadi until there's not one small stone found there. And Absalom and all the men of Israel then said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel. For Yahuwah had ordained to nullify the good advice of Ahithophel for the sake of Yahuwah bringing evil upon Absalom. Isn't that savage? Yahuwah has set this up too, and he's giving favor upon the advice of Hushai to disrupt and destroy and bring about the destruction of Absalom. Because unfortunately, when you play in the kingdom of pride, you're going to lose severely. Because as it says in the book of Job, the king over all the children of pride is Leviathan. And you know what it says in the book of Psalms? Written by David. How Yahuwah deals with Leviathan too. You ready for this? Make some food for the people in the wilderness. Verse 15. Then Hushai then said to Zadok and to Abiathar the priest, these are the spies, Ahithophel has advised Absalom and the elders of Israel such and such, but I have advised so and so. And now send hastily that inform David, saying, Do not spend this night in the desert plains of the wilderness, but pass over without fail, lest the sovereign and all the people with him be swallowed up. And Jonathan and Achimatz were stationed at en Rogel, and a female servant would come and inform them, and they would go and inform Sovereign David, for they could not be seen entering the city. But a youth saw them and informed Absalom. Two of the men went away at once, came to the man's house in Bahorim, who had a well in his courtyard, and they went down into it. And the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth, and spread ground grain on it, so that the matter was not known. So you can hide people under their fresh milk flour. Hallelujah to the Millanites. If you haven't watched our Becoming a Millanite playlist, check that thing out, man. You'll have a fantastic time. Fresh grinding your grain is going to save the world. Don't buy their dead bread. Every piece of bread at the store is dead. I don't care if it's organic. Even, if, even the Ezekiel bread, you guys, it's not living. They're like, it's sprouted and then sifted to death. Please understand something. It's a whole long story. I love it. Go look it up. Fantastic. Fresh milk will change your life. You'll finally be able to poop. You're welcome. No more needs for those horrible poisons coming into your body so you can poop. Just eat fiber in the form of bran. It's delicious. And it came to be after that they left, that they came up. Let me go back, sorry. Verse 20. And the servants of Absalom came to the woman's house and said, Where are Achimots and Jonathan? And the woman said, They passed over the stream of water. And they looked and did not find them and returned to Jerusalem. And it came to be after they had left that they came out of the well and went up and informed Sovereign David and said to David, Arise and pass over the water quickly, for thus Ahithophel has advised against you. 
And David and all the people who were with him rose up and passed over the Yarden. And by the morning light, not even one remained who had gone over the Yarden. And Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed. So he saddled his donkey and rose up and went home to his house, to his city. Then he gave command to his house and hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's burial site. And David came to Mahanaim. So now, literally, the words of Ahithophel did not come to pass. So he goes and kills himself. It's very similar to what you find in the book of Esther with these wicked counselors. The conspirators literally kill themselves oftentimes. Something to consider. And David came to Mahanaim, and Absalom passed over the Yarden, he and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom appointed Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Now Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Yithra, a Yisraeli, who had gone into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash. Nahash again, sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. And Yisrael and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilad. And it came to be when David had come to Mahanaim, that Shobi, the son of Nahash from Rabbah, of the children of Ammon, and Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodeber, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Ragolim, brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and roasted grain and beans and lentils and parched vegetables and honey and curds and sheep and cheese of the herd for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, The people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. And David mustered the... Chapter 18. And David mustered the people who were with him and set commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds over them. And David sent out one third of the people under the hand of Joab and one third under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and one third under Ittai, the Gittite. And the sovereign said to the people, I shall certainly go out with you too. But the people answered, Do not go out, for if we flee away, they would not set heart upon us, even if half of us die. They would not set heart upon us, for now ten thousand are like us. Therefore, it's better for you to support us from the city. And the sovereign said to him, That which is good in your eyes I do. And the sovereign stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. And the sovereign ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the people heard when the sovereign gave all the commander's orders concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field to meet Yisrael, and the battle was in the forests of Ephraim. And the people of Yisrael were smitten there before the servants of David, and the slaughter there that day was great, twenty thousand. And the battle there was scattered over the face of all the land, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. And when Absalom met the servants of David, Absalom was riding on a mule, And the mule went under the thick branches of a great terebinth tree, and his head caught hold in the terebinth, and he was suspended between the heavens and the earth, while the mule which was under him passed on. And a certain man saw it and informed Joab and said, Look, I saw Absalom hanging in the terebinth tree. And Joab said to the man who informed him, Now look, you saw. Why did you not strike him to the earth? Then I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt. But the man answered Joab, Though I were to receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the son of the sovereign, because in our hearing the sovereign commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Take heed, you who go against the youth and against Absalom. Otherwise I would have been untrue to my own life, for no matter is hidden from the sovereign, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. And Joab said, Let me not waste time here with you. And he took three spears in his hand, thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And ten young men who bore Joab's armor went around and struck Absalom and put him to death. And Joab blew with the shofar, and the people returned from pursuing Yisrael, for Joab had held the people back. And they took Absalom and threw him into a large pit in the forest and heaped a very large pile of stones over him. And all Yisrael fled, each to his tent. And Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a monument for himself, which is in the Sovereign's Valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the monument after his own name. And to this day it is called Absalom's 
monument. You see this story, you guys? Absalom's death literally comes from that long hair of his and from him and the pride of his heart lifting himself up to try to take over his father's kingdom. But you know what? Yahuwah rendered Mishfat. That's justice and righteousness. He entered Mishfat and Zadikah on the entire situation. And you know what? David reaped the consequences of his actions from long ago. And here we are years later. Thousands of sons of Israel are dead. There's a total insurrection. The kingdom has been destabilized. And you know what? The nation has been cracking at its seams. And it takes a long time for that to get reestablished. There's micro feuds and conflicts that take place along the way. Another insurrection rises rises up later on. And you know what? The kingdom, the rest of David's kingdom is not in the same peacefulness ever again. And you know what? This is the reality of when those seeds germinate and when these principality wars take flight, you know, it's messy, it's bloody and it's brutal. But you know what? The word has these lessons in there for us to learn from, to grow from, mature in them so that we can be clothed with the mind of our Messiah so that we can walk in wisdom and knowledge and understanding and we can be prosperous in our ways. I love going on this journey with you guys today. I hope you guys have a fantastic, incredibly invigorating day that you would live courageously every single day of your life because the days may be evil, but you were born for such a time as this. I love you guys so much. Talk to you soon.